and gentlemen, my name is Gennady Myers, and welcome. Uh, you are at the Academy of Vocal Arts. This is a Russian Opera Workshop. Uh, Russian Opera Workshop is an independent uh, summer program for aspiring uh, opera singers as well as professional opera singers that come uh, for one full month, and uh, sometimes two, uh, to study Russian operas. And uh, so we are very privileged to be um, in this building uh, at the Academy of Vocal Arts. Just out of curiosity, how many of you are in this building for the first time? Okay, wonderful, wonderful, welcome. Uh, so let me just give you just one minute, one minute before I introduce my very good friend. Um, Academy of Vocal Arts is a premier opera school um, and I happen to be on the faculty here and also uh, at the Curtis Institute of Music where uh, I was a student and now I teach. Um, Academy of Vocal Arts uh, trains uh, singers to become uh, opera professionals, uh, professional opera uh, singers and we have great uh, success. Uh, if you open um, Opera News, uh, you will see the, the new wave uh, they called this article, I just got an email today that says you gotta see this. So I haven't read the article yet, New Way, so it names uh, alums like uh, Angela Mead, Michael Fabiano, Stephen Costello, Eileen Perez, and on and on. So there, there is a group of very talented individuals that uh, studied here and went on to make for three years. Um, and so uh, my uh, daily work at the Academy of Vocal Arts is that I, I work only on the Russian uh, repertory and uh, we do uh, one concert a year of uh, Russian songs or arias and sometimes operas. So um, I do want to plug um, an opera that we will be doing as part of the Academy of Vocal Arts season this coming up, this season that's coming up and it's Eugene Onegin and it's going to take place in January of 13. So uh, please uh, take some materials to read and uh, we hope to see you uh, here. Um, we started the Russian Opera program last year. As I mentioned, it's an independent program. It's not affiliated with uh, uh, any other institution. Um, and we've attracted some really outstanding talent. Uh, last year we did uh, two operas, Eugene Onegin by Tchaikovsky and Iolanda also by Tchaikovsky. Um, five of our alums from Eugene Onegin went on uh, to perform the roles that they've learned within the first year. They were hired at different companies. So this is kind of overnight immediate success. And this is wonderful. And this is the reason uh, people come here is to learn things that are done less uh, frequently and to be ready and to know the roles and be able to step in as, as we've had it over the past year. Um, this year, uh, in June, we've performed an opera by uh, Rachmaninoff uh, called Aleko. It's his first opera. Uh, for the first time, we introduced, well, we're only two years of existence, but uh, this year we've introduced um, collaborative uh, uh, piano, which we had uh, two collaborative students, one for each session, that worked with us. And also in Rachmaninoff uh, opera, we had um, a chorus that it was uh, comprised of singers from the Greater Philadelphia Singers Group, uh, from Mendelssohn Club, uh, Choral Arts, and, and it was just a wonderful experience. I think everybody loved it, and uh, it was just overall wonderful for the artists as well as our audiences. Um, and so here we are. This is our last opera. We're in, this is The Queen of Spades by Tchaikovsky. Uh, it's an incredible piece. I think Tchaikovsky <laughs> himself wrote that he thought it was a masterpiece. But I will not be talking about this because we have an excellent guest that's going to talk to you about this. And um, we will be performing um, the Queen of Spades in the next three days, uh, starting tomorrow at 7.30. Uh, we have a rather large uh, cast for, for us, uh, for a small program. Um, and uh, we have students, or I shouldn't say students, really artists, uh, that came from Canada, the lower United States, and we have somebody from Mexico here as well that came to study with us. And we have one artist that lives in St. Petersburg and attends St. Petersburg Conservatory. So we have Russia involved as well. Uh, 
I, I want to introduce, this is a pretty easy introduction, um, and this is a classmate of mine when we were students of Kurtz. We kid a lot, so. Uh, <laughs> um, Darren is a composer, and, and you see the, the, the bio, I don't have it in front of me, but it is rich, his body of work is pretty remarkable um, in all areas of music. And uh, he write, he's written, did you say eight or nine? Eight operas? Eight operas. And, you know, this is his full-time occupation. He is a composer that lives doing this work and, and supporting his wonderful family. And uh, it is a privilege to have Darren Hagen. Did I mispronounce your name again? No. <laughs> no, I just said Darren, right? You've never said it incorrectly in your whole life. Oh, thank you. I appreciate <laughs> that. Okay. And so um, we were having dinner, I have to say this. I really have to say this. Uh, we were having dinner, and all of a sudden, Darren receives a phone call from Ned Gorham. <laughs> <laughs> what are the chances of that? Not Please good. tell your story. Darren Hagen. <laughs> I make must begin with a Ned Roram story. <laughs> He's a, he, ta he, he, like so many of our older colleagues, has taken up a lot of room, as did Tchaikovsky. Uh, as it happens, Ned's phone call came because uh, there, oh, it's complicated, but we're going to see each other and the children, my boys, one and four, will go over and play at Ned's house sometime in the next two weeks because my boys treat him as an absolute equal. <laughs> Several years ago, my four-year-old was two and Ned, uh, he was, he's beautiful, like as Ned was and is. And <clears throat> he came up to Ned and grabbed him by the knees. And Ned said, I suppose you think you're quite special. And my boy said, yes. <laughs> and they looked at each other, and there was nothing more to be said. <laughs> they were friends forever. And uh, I, am, I have always been quite moved that, that my boys love Ned, and Ned loves my boys. Uh, oh, surprised and moved when uh, Gena and I met as students back at the Curtis Institute back in the early, very early 1980s. Uh, Ned Roram was the person who uh, hoisted me by my own petard out of the Midwest, accepted me at the Curtis Institute as a student, and changed my life. Now, everything that has unfolded since is, uh, since has not been of his creation, it has been of my creation, but the person who shoves you through the door is always and forever a person you honor and are grateful to. Well, now he's shoving my children through the door. <laughs> okay, now I'm here, so that's, that, that's the end of that. I'm going to put this little stand here because I'm speaking to these performing artists, but I'm also speaking to you. This is an extraordinary situation, and the reason that I always have loved conversing with Gena and my brothers and sisters in the opera world is because we so joyously reveal the obvious to one another. Uh, Oscar Levant used to say of Leonard Bernstein that he'd made uh, a business of revealing openly known facts to the world. Well, when opera singers and opera composers and stage directors and designers get together over lunch or breakfast when we're in production, you're in a city for three weeks. You don't know that city. You have breakfast with the cast because you're going to rehearse from 11 o'clock until 6 o'clock at night. That's why opera singers get fat too, right? Because, <laughs> because you've got nothing to do but eat and rehearse. And then you sing. And then what are you going to do after the concert, after the performance, but eat? And then, you know, and then you go to bed. And how can you exercise? 
How does Nathan Dunn do it? <laughs> well, I know how he does. He was in one of my shows. He does it eat. And he's constantly working out. But the opera business is different than it once was. But what we talk about in private is what I'm going to talk about now with you. So in a way, what I'm doing, ladies and gentlemen, is I'm trying to invite you into what opera singers talk to each other about in rediscovering opera and trying to figure out why this, they're doing this opera and why these lunatics who compose opera would do it in the first place. <laughs> Queen, when, what are you doing with your lives, people? <laughs> what am I doing with my life? <laughs> so what I've, what I've done is I've created something that is geared toward primarily our brothers and sisters, the singers. But I'm sharing it with you, and I want to invite you in, and I want you to feel a part of it. It's called Unlucky at Cards. <laughs> Life is a game. Or, because you have to have ors, because who can decide on the title? Luck or fate, you decide. <laughs> It's not Wagner. Wagner's already decided for you, hasn't he? <laughs> this is an operatic talk about an opera by Tchaikovsky called Queen Spades. It's going to be in five scenes with an interlude that's bloated, because what composer can resist a bloated interlude? <laughs> in the shape of an opera libretto. Why me? Pray, prologue. Captain Beer alone. I am an old man. Well, I'm an, a middle-aged composer. I was chosen for this because I'm not an academic. I speak to you as someone who writes operas. Glass, Philip Glass has written, what, 20 plus? Adams has written at least a dozen plus Menotti, our mentor, at least a dozen. Uh, Britain, what, 15 plus, something like that? But it is Tchaikovsky's 11 that have always earned my awe. I look at Britain for things to see. <laughs> I look at Tchaikovsky because I can't figure out how he can speak in such long sentences <laughs> and make such great sense. Music takes place in time. His melodies, right now, we always joke about the, the, the cello sonata, that you don't take the repeats because God will be there all night. It goes forever. It's very, yeah, it's very hard to do Russian music because the tunes are so long. And you have to recapitulate the entire tune. It's not like Beethoven, da 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 da. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Develop that. <laughs> not a problem. <laughs> no. But Tchaikovsky takes a little bit longer. I've written eight operas. I'm a full time professional opera composer. Well, that's made possible by. 1.5 generations of American composers. But it is also made possible by Tchaikovsky, who was the first Russian, now Russia's a big place, the first Russian full-time opera composer. Now, he cobbled that together exquisitely. I mean, he was at the conservatory. He was teaching at the Moscow Conservatory before it was called what it was called. The Tchaikovsky. Yes. He also had a patroness, the, the Countess von Mack, right? Henry McElhenney was my patron when I was a Curtis student. He had met von Mack, I had the Tabasco King for, for three precious years, and it was quite exquisite, actually, and I learned about that old tradition. But with, and of course, his great uh, supporter, the man who commissioned this opera, uh, made possible uh, a stipend from the federal government for Tchaikovsky, a small stipend that made it possible for him to say, 
know. And for him to go on journeys of self-discovery. So when I speak of opera, I do so as an opera composer who views operas as a theater professional. I am not a musicologist. I don't pretend to be. I don't want to be. But I'm a professional. I look at them and I say, what works? What doesn't work? What is he trying to say? Ultimately, and this is going to sound very tired, but what was his polemic? Polemic is a terrible word. Artists don't want to hear about polemic. But what was he trying to say, and how did he say it? Because nobody asks anybody to sit in a room for two and a half or three and a half hours in the old days without having a very clear agenda. And that's what I'm going to be leading to in the course of these 30 minutes that I, I have, you've generously given me your attention. I'm going to lead to uh, what I think was his polemic. Tchaikovsky, who I'm sure would not have thought in those terms. But what, what is he trying to say? No man would ever take up your time without having a plan. What else was going on in the story? OK, now, that was my prelude. <laughs> Scene one. Historical context or setting the stage. These, this show was written in the 1890s. They were the gay 90s before the gay 90s were gay. Okay. <laughs> it was a different sort of a gay. The term wasn't coined until 26. Mark Twain called it the Gilded Age. We, it was the age of the robber barons, all of these bold terms, the fricks. Vanderbilt, the, everybody we're talking about, all the people whose names are on the libraries and, and all of the places that we, we love to go. Why did they make these places? Well, they were people who had made a lot of money. Rockefeller, Flagler, Carnese, Astor, my goodness. It must have felt during Tchaikovsky's lifetime as though there was a massive storm collecting on the horizon. The reason that I was very excited to talk about Queen of Spades was because I believe the same sort of storm is on the horizon today. The reason I believe Mark Lutzstein, The Cradle Will Rock is a timely opera is the same reason that I believe Queen of Spades is a timely opera. This is a time where ominous opulence coexisted cheek by jowl with terrible poverty in the United States, everywhere, where the social contract was being stretched. I don't want to skip straight to my point, otherwise you won't listen to me anymore. But <laughs> This was a time when, not surprisingly, fascism was on the rise. When ordinary people feel pressed by the system, they look for easy answers, perhaps, in moments of weakness. Don't we all? I do. When I'm tired, I look for someone to blame. It must have felt as though something terrible was going to happen. This was a time when Marx had died in London, a stateless person, having written a book that would, for better or worse, change the world. That's not how, right? It was a time uh, when Tsar Nicholas's coronation would be filmed. Film would enter our collective poetic memory with an amazing public event. It was a time they call the fin de siècle, right? It was as, I've got a little thing here, which is Barbara Tuchman, who I love. Have you ever heard of her? Probably. The wonderful popular historian. I read her as a teenager, because what's not to love about her? She said, civilization, civilization at this point resembled the fever chart of a patient, not the fever itself. And a lot of people thought that civilization itself was something that 
would inevitably lead to decadence. Now, of course, six feet down the road, we've got modernism, where we're going to clean up the joint. But we're not talking about modernism yet. We're talking not about Sherberg and the Second Viennese School hatching their nefarious atonal plots in Vienna. <laughs> <laughs> we're still talking about a culture, a Russian culture dominated by the French, where people who were educated and who knew things about things venerated Western culture, not Eastern culture. And a decision was being made among people like Tchaikovsky and his brothers and sisters. Do we look West or do we look East? Nationalism. You know, it was at this very time that the first seeds of the artistic nationalism were planted that grew up to be the American symphonic composers of the 40s, for example. Or, you know, Copeland and Harris and all those wonderful guys. But then who were they in Germany? Eisler, Weil. It was a very interesting, sort of a, a, a hotbed time. In France, the Dreyfus affair unfolded, anti-Semitism with its weird sort of half thought out pseudo-scientific basis in, in the new study of eugenics, whatever that was, was becoming mainstream. People who normally wouldn't speak about these things started talking about scapegoats and about whole races who were responsible for the fact that you had no money. It was somebody else's fault that you had no money. America was being served at this time by her least remembered possibly presidents. Can you remember who the presidents were in the 1890s? I, I couldn't, I'm, I'm, I have to say, I, but I wrote them down. Chester A. Arthur, Grover Cleveland, <laughs> William McKinley. 1901, Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah. <laughs> Closer to my heart, the Battle of Sugar Point in Minnesota. The last uprising of Native American Indians was quelled. That was it. That happened during the 1890s. Ernest Hemingway, born in 1890. The man who liked to make easy, simple, clear, manly sentences. <laughs> Why? Because he came out of this cauldron of complexity and, and what you don't understand must be decadent, mustn't it? It's important to know that Pushkin's short story, The Queen of Spades, comes out of this historical context. Now, as a non-academic, as a composer, that is as close as I will come to ethnomusicology. <laughs> so, if you're an ethnomusicologist, forgive me. I am unworthy. But that's how a composer thinks when he's trying to write a new piece and say something about the time in which he lives and try to understand what he might say. Scene two, Pushkin's original short story or going to the source document. It was first published in 1834. That's a long time. Things, composers are like magpies. We're constantly looking for scenarios. We're worse than film studios. We're always looking something for a, a, a skeleton on which we can hang our picadillo, uh, a, a story that we can use to talk about the things that fire us. Any of you who have gone through uh, analysis have been led to a conversation, ultimately, over the years, uh, either in dribs and drabs or in one cathartic conversation where you say, what were the themes? The themes of Pushkin's short story, arguably, are greed, not surprisingly, compulsion. What, now, compulsion is one powerful thing. Compulsion. Compulsion is about taking away your will and turning you into a slave to that which you want to do. I've got a four-year-old, and 
he wants to play with those blocks. Honey, you can't play with those blocks. <laughs> Honey, melting down will not get you the blocks. But I want to play with the blocks. Honey, if you calm down and you ask, we'll discuss it. That's not going to happen. Not at four. That's compulsion. And that's when an adult infantilizes themselves or are infantilized by some trigger. 1880s, 1890s, Freud, Vienna, the study of compulsion, the study of forced thinking, the finding of sexual misfunction or malfunction as the reason for your current compulsion. Moral weakness. Now this is more close, this is something that would have, I think, drawn Tchaikovsky in. Moral weakness. Oh dear, dishonesty. <sighs> now, I was brought up a Lutheran. Don't lie. No one's gonna catch you. Because you're Lutheran, you don't talk anyway. <laughs> but you will know. And you're gonna pay. You will. A Catholic can make it right with good works. A Lutheran can. You lie. <laughs> what's, this, what's this story? I know I'm being very naughty and I'm being, if anyone is offended, I apologize. I'm, I'm just trying to make a point. Here's the story of the original Pushkin, and I think it's important to tell the story of the short story because it differs substantially from the opera that was made by the brothers Tchaikovsky. It's a Russian officer, Russian military officer named Hermann, an ethnic German, I think that's important. He obsessively watches his colleagues gamble in bowling but never joined them. His friend Tomsky tells him a story about his grandmother, an elderly countess, who, has, who had won a fortune and lost it in cards, mm -hmm. then won it back with the secret of the <laughs> His obsession morphs into wanting to learn the secret. Something for nothing, anyone? He learns that the countess has a young ward named Lisavietta, right? He woos her in order to get close to the countess. He gets close to the countess. She says, it's all a lie. I made it up. He pulls a gun on her. He says, tell me, or I'll kill you. She drops dead, scares her to death. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. This is why I love Pushkin. It happens that her ward lives downstairs in the building. He, wants, he goes downstairs. He says, but, but it's not that bad because I knew the gun wasn't loaded. So it's only manslaughter. It's not murder. And besides, she didn't tell me anything. And this and the other thing. Well, she, of course, she loads him. She detests him. She has contempt for him. But she saves him the way you do. The way you do for somebody that you love, who is contempt-worthy. Now, this is something I think Tchaikovsky also really felt a trigger for. Okay, the count, they're at the Countess's funeral. This is like a, uh, what is that show that was on HBO for a while? Dead Like, no, not Dead Like Me. Uh, Six Feet Under. At the funeral, she opens her eyes and she looks at him. Good enough. He goes home, he has a dream, and the dream, of course, is that he's going to play cards for three nights. Yes. On the third night, he's going to play a? Three. Three. Second night, he's going to play a? Seven. On the third night, he's going to play a? Ace. But! Look here. <laughs> <laughs> That's like a fantasy come true. <laughs> Of Christmas past, present, future. <laughs> of course, last night, instead of an ace, Queen of Spades comes up, right? Well, 
<laughs> he <laughs> dissolves. And he ends up spending the rest of his days in an insane asylum, muttering, three, seven, ace. Three, seven, ace. story. Um, anybody ever been to Vegas? Well, I wrote an opera called Vera in Las Vegas, which is in, more of that anon, um, about this sort of thing. The temptation, the allure of something for nothing, the sudden trapdoor to being saved or getting out of this Horrible paradigm. Scene three. Who else took on this story? It's a short scene, I promise. We'll call this the choral number. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, this, this, I only know this because I know Halevi and I'm sort of a fan. You know Fromental Halevi? French composer? Anybody ever heard of him? Yes! You know, he did work in quarter tones in the 1890s. Isn't that bizarre and cool? Well, he, he did uh, uh, La Dama de Pique in 1850, and uh, Wagner thought it was great. I read a little thing on the internet that Wagner admired the work. Sort of frightening. Uh, <laughs> Heine called him a man without the slightest spark of genius. <laughs> there you go. He wrote 40 it's sort of like, uh, it's a sort of terrible thing to say. I think William Schumann is, was a very important American composer. But he's sort of the William Schumann of his time. He became a very important member of the French Academy. He became somebody who did a lot for French music. 40 operas. So he took this on, it, it, it has, it's rarely performed. Franz von Suppé, now we know the overture, right? I mean, anybody who's gone to pop concerts or summer deals, Anybody who's watched cartoons as a kid. <laughs> Bugs Bunny, right? Papa. All those Eastern European Jews who played in the Hollywood film orchestras after the war and before World War II. They fled Europe. Come in. And you look at Max Steiner, you look at all of these. Who was, who was that wonderful composer who wrote? Stalin. Carl Stalin. He knew Zubay. And this is great stuff. And the Zupé Overture to his Down is still performed. It's a cool piece. It's a really exciting piece. Well, that's, that's scene three, because that was me. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, that, was, that was about all the actual uh, research that I did for this. Scene four, the Tchaikovsky Brothers treatment. Now, we know that. Modest, Modo, Mo, uh, not Modest, Mozarski, Modest Tchaikovsky was, like his brother, uh, homosexual. The two had a strong bond of understanding, and they worked together on several projects, including his last project, yeah. Yolanta, about which I spoke last year, and about which I have equally passionate feelings. If Yolanta was about his passionate, Tchaikovsky's passionate belief that love was enough. The next place that you go after this story, <coughs> then this story was, as a penultimate opera, something that dealt with something almost as important. It was the penultimate stop before that really existential argument. Three acts, seven scenes. Three acts. How do you take a short story and turn it into three acts? Well, that's the thing. Short stories make great operas because when you set something to music, it takes twice as long to sing as it was to say. <laughs> one of the problems with Bernstein's Candide, one of the reasons I could never fix a second act, is because Candide's a book. And it turns into a travelogue for the second half of the book. The second act is a disaster. All of a sudden, Garden Girl happens, and you're crying, and you go, I hate you people. <laughs> <laughs> you completely pulled this out of your theatrical patootie. <laughs> that's, and that's not a problem you have with a short story. 
you can expand a short story and put stuff into it as opposed to War and Peace, which is brutal because War and Peace is all about taking this stuff out, right? The libretto was more the by my guess. Uh, the composition history is this, something that blows me away. Um, it was written in 44 days. This is a lot of music. Um, I'm, I took a lot of flack in my 20s and 30s for being a very facile composer, very, very fast, because I worked very hard to get my technique up so that I could compose quickly. But 44 days for a two and a half hour opera, not including intermissions, is... <laughs> said, think slow, write fast. I am in awe. You, and I, 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 I sort of get it, but I'm in awe. What is the nature of the librettist composer? Um, Tchaikovsky rewrote, <coughs> revised, and edited the libretto as he set his brother's libretto to music. Um, speaking as a composer who's worked with a lot of librettists, um, this is what we do. We don't talk about it in the press, partly because of our contracts, but partly because we respect our librettists. But composers always rewrite librettos. And we're really aggravated when people say, isn't it nice that you were given such a great libretto to set? <laughs> because it was a great libretto, but it was the synergy of librettist and composer that made it work. It, were, it was the changes. It was not the underlining and highlighting, but the excision of entire paragraphs of exposition or things that Tchaikovsky just didn't think was important that gave Tchaikovsky the time to focus